Hello, and welcome to Applied Imagery's Getting Started series. This multi-part series is designed to get users proficient in the tools and capabilities available within the Quick Terrain Modeler software. This chapter covers a real-world example workflow of preparing point cloud data, generating a bare earth digital elevation model, and creating products for export such as contours and fly-through movies. The topics are shown here. Let's get started with a real-world workflow. I have my 16 LAS files loaded into QT Modeler. I'm going to start by clicking the G key, which opens up Google, and it should zoom me to the right spot. This is my first sign that the geotags are pretty good in this file. Now I'm going to hold down the Shift key and left click a point. This queries a point and it shows me all the attributes associated. So I'm just checking to make sure that the attributes in this file are populated. I can see that my return information is populated along with my classification. I'm going to get back to that in just a moment. I'm also going to left click an individual model. This brings up that model information. And again, just double checking the extents, cycle through a few of these, and make sure that the extents are proper and that the scale and density are relatively uniform to one another. I'm clicking the down and up arrows to cycle through each file. I'm now gonna check the overall densities of the data by opening up my grid statistics tool, changing my variable to density, clicking calculate metrics, and click okay. Right now what we're seeing on the screen is a combination of the vertex colors, which is the intensity, as well as the density. So I'm just gonna turn off my vertex colors. So I'm just looking at my density map. Should I wanna export this density map, I can right click the density texture here and click export. So far this data is looking pretty good. And if the purpose of this exercise is to generate a bare earth model, I wanna to check to see what kind of classifications there are. Obviously it would be easiest just to filter by class two ground and interpolate as opposed to having to classify the ground in the first place. I'm going to go ahead and click the QTA button, which is our quick color, and choose color by classification. I can see I have a number of classes in this data. I've got my bare earth, I've got some uh, water, as well as some overpasses. The overpasses class 17 are, are good if I want to generate a, a digital elevation model, a bare earth model, for transportation purposes. I probably want to keep those bridges in. If I'm trying to do it for hydro purposes, then I would filter out class 17. That way the bridges don't act as dams. I usually like to rotate the data on its side and look to see if there's any kind of outlying da data. And sure enough, I can see some, some high points as well as low points. And I'm looking to make sure that, yep, these low points are class seven. I've got a couple low points as class 18, which is also a noise class, so that would be fine. So really I just want to filter this data for class seven and class 18, and I should be fine. I'm going to go to Analysis, Filtering, QTA Discrete Filtering. I'm going to choose my classification field as my dropdown and click Pack Attribute into Filter Channel. You can see all my classes are shown as well as with the number of points per class. I'm going to hold down the Control key and select Class 7 and Class 18. So that will remove those two classes from the data. So if I wanted to create a pretty clean DSM, a digital surface model, at this point I would click Crop Model and then I would go on to convert this into a surface model. But because this exercise, I want to create a bare earth model, I'm just going to include my class two points as well as my class nine points. I'm going to include my water points here as well. If I wanted to create a digital elevation model with my overpasses in there, I would also just include class 17. I'm going to remove class 17 for now and click crop model. So I'm now um, left with just my class two ground and my class nine water. I'm gonna go back and check my return information. QTA color by first, last intermediate. And this is mostly what I would expect to see. Uh, the white points are the first and only. So the only return that got returned back to the sensor um, and the blue points are the last of many's. The red points are the first of many, so it looks like it's just clipping the edges of some of these transportation corridors. So that looks okay to me also. If I saw a big clump of first return data, uh, maybe that might be some trees that didn't get filtered out. But this looks pretty normal to me. And now I want to convert this point cloud into a surface model. I'm going to go to Edit. I'm going to go to Merge Models. Merge Models has the added benefit of being able to merge multiple files and do the conversion at the same time. So I'm going to select my 16 files in my Model Submerge section, click my drop down and choose QTT Gridded Surface, and I'm going to create a one meter bare earth model. 
If I want to change the triangulation or interpolation settings, I would click on gridding options. And I have my unload selected models after merge unchecked. And that will just leave the remaining point clouds back in there. So I can go back to the points and edit them as needed. I'm going to go ahead and click merge. So now that's done, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my point clouds and look at my resulting surface model. At first glance, it might look like I still have buildings and trees in here, uh, but this is the intensity image. So I'm just going to turn off the intensity in the bare earth model, and you can see it's just left with just the bare earth. At this point, again, I like to do some sanity checking. I'm going to left click the surface model that it exported. Just check my extents, make sure they make sense. My Z min and Z max, again, understanding that there's no tall buildings or anything left, uh, just making sure the min and max are reasonable. Everything's looking all right. Uh, and again, just an, another min-max trick, I'm going to go to analysis, I'm going to go to my point finder tool. And what this is going to do is it's going to show me the highest or lowest X number of points in any attribute. Uh, so I'm just going to try to find my highest 100 points and go ahead and click find. I can double click on one of these and that brings me to that point and it's selected. So I'm just, in, I'm just confirming that the highest cluster of points that I have left in my data are valid ground points making sure it didn't leave a spike or leave any kind of artifact in the data that shouldn't be there. Same thing, I'm just gonna switch this now to the lowest 100 points. Go ahead and click Find. I'm gonna double click, which zooms me to that area. And sure enough, my lowest 100 points are in this little depression here. We'll take another look at that. That looks uh, a little interesting. So let's go ahead and uh, zoom in here. Um, use one of our hotkeys, the Z key, which re-ramps the, the height coloration based on your view extent. Uh, and it looks like they're doing some construction here. They, they dug out this area here, seem to have deposited off to the side here. So now we're pretty much confirmed that the bare earth model contains all the valid ground points. Um, there's no anomalies as far as high and low anomalies in here. I'm um, just gonna zoom around and this, this area here looks of interest. I'm gonna go ahead and hit Control Z. Again, that re-ramps the uh, view extent colors back to the full extent. Just gonna compare this to the point clouds. I'm gonna turn on the points. And yeah, it does look like there was maybe some construction here in the point cloud. I'm going to go ahead back to the surface model, turn the point cloud off. And I'm just going to edit this out. I'm going to go to edit, edit mode. I'm going to use my selection polygon and just draw an area. It really wouldn't matter what type of selection polygon you're going to use in this example, either the screen select or the Z. I have my area selected. I'm going to click the smooth area button. That has now been smoothed out. And obviously I could repeat that process for any other dips in the data that I might want to get rid of. This data isn't showing any kind of spike anomalies. Um, had we found some spike anomalies, uh, this repair dem tool is really good. Uh, click on that repair dem. There's a spike removal filter, uh, and that does a great job at removing any kind of spikes from the data. If you don't want to run it on the entire data set, just draw a selection polygon first, and then the repair dem will operate just within that selection polygon. Now that the dem is, uh, is clear and ready to go, we can right click and export to GeoTIFF DEM, which is a very common format for GeoTIFFs. Or we can go up here to Export, Export Models, and choose from a number of different file formats. I'm going to generate some contours. I'm going to left click on our Toggle Contours button. And now I have some contours for my data. If I right click on that same button, I have some additional options and settings to choose from. One thing notice that I'm in meters. Uh, this data is in meters, both the horizontal and vertical. So all of the data units in QT are going to be in meters. Um, but I want to switch that to feet, so I'm just going to go to File, Options and Settings, Set Display Units, and I'm going to change my vertical and horizontal to US feet. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And now if I right click that same toggle contours button, now I'm showing my vertical spacing in foot intervals. I'm going to drag that down to two feet, enter in two, click Apply. And I'm going to generate contours for the data. Click Generate vectors. At this point, QT Modeler is displaying two types of contours right now. I have my real-time contours turned on as well as my new contour vector that I exported. So make sure to toggle this off and you can toggle this off as well. And that's how you'll toggle on and off contours. If you want to do some smoothing of the contours, just make your sampling a little bit larger and that increases the interval of samples along each contour, which has a smoothing effect. I'm going to go ahead and close my contour window. And if I want to export contours, I'm going to right click, go to export, and I have a few separate options to choose from. Now I'm going to move on to cross sections. I'm going to turn off my contours. And I'm going to start by drawing a center line down the center of my river corridor. 
If you already have a center line, uh, you can import that as well and use that as a seed for the cross section tool. And right click to end that line. I'm going to go to cross section generation tool. I'm going to choose 600 foot wide cross sections, spaced at every 100 feet. I like to change my numbering increment to match my spacing. And I'm going to click generate lines. I know there are a few different uses for cross sections. Uh, for those of you that don't want these cross sections to intersect like they do here, simply double click them. You can right click to insert additional nodes and then you can change where the cross sections fall if you need to. Within this tool, you can export something called cross stations. So if I click on the export cross stations button, this will export the intersection point between the center line as well as each cross section. Now I'm going to click on the push CS lines to CS analysis tool. And now I have my various cross sections. All of these cross sections can be exported by clicking this button here, export sample to cross sections. Or you can select subsets within this layer tree on the left hand side and right click and then export just the selected cross sections. Measurements can also be calculated in here. Use your scroll wheel to zoom in and out, your right mouse button to pan. So I can measure the vertical difference between some of these various cross sections here. I'm going to close this down and clean up some of my scene. I don't need to save that. I'm also going to turn off all my markers and turn off my measurement line. And I'm going to generate a slope map. I'm going to go to Analysis, Analysis Tools, and Slope Map. It'll automatically calculate, um, but you may want to adjust the scale of your coloration. So I usually like to drag that maximum down a little bit. and It helps to highlight some of the steeper areas. I always recommend keeping that safe snapshot checked when available and click on the push to vertex colors. And this adds this as a data layer underneath my merge surface model. I'm going to turn on my vertex colors. This is where I can see the results of my analysis. And if I want to export this slope map as an image, I'm just going to right click my slope map and export as a GeoTIFF or a KMZ. Note this is just going to be an RGB export. This isn't going to be exported the values. To export the values, everything is contained within the file itself. So I'm going to hold down the shift key and left click a point or pixel. In this case, it's a pixel in the surface model. And I can see I have my intensity value as well as my slope information embedded in each pixel. So I'm going to right click on the merge data file and click on export manage QTA attributes. So if I want to export the slope values, I'm going to go to my slope attribute. I can rename if I'd like and then export a new GeoTIFF, which will contain the values per pixel as opposed to just the coloration for the slope. I'm going to move on to some additional hydro analysis. I'm going to overlay some imagery as well. So I'm going to click on, click on my import WMS imagery button. Then I'm going to choose retrieve and then click accept. I can close this down. And now I have a web mapping service image draped on top of my 3D data. I'm going to start by raising and lowering a water profile. I'm going to zoom in over here to this baseball field. I'm going to start to increase the water level until it starts to inundate. Now this is a horizontal plane that gets raised and lowered, oftentimes referred to as a bathtub model. So as long as we've got connection between the puddled water to the water source, then this analysis should be valid. So here we can see at a certain height of water, the water will spill over this higher ground and start to cover the street. I'm going to go ahead and use my selection polygon and just draw a polygon around the street. I want to calculate how much water is contained within there. I'm going to go ahead and change my model to be an analyzed to the merge data file. Click on calculate. And I've got 10,347 cubic feet of water here. As the water goes a little higher, it looks like the water will continue to spill out until eventually it will reach this parking lot. And again, I'm going to go through and now check the volume of water in this parking lot. I can create a height profile across my data as well. And the, whole pro the height profile is linked to the water profile as well. So as I raise and lower my water level here, you can see it moving up and down in my height profile. That way I was able to calculate a volume, an area, a surface area of water, and I can zoom in here to the height profile and calculate the depth. And we have a depth of 2.85 feet. I like to also do this on a smaller scale. So as I zoom into the parking lot, for example, and just start to dial this down a little bit, show where water will drain out. In this case, I just want to make sure that all the water is draining from the parking lot into the storm drains, and it looks like they are. 
there's also a contour feature uh, within this water profile tool. So if I want to generate a contour here, I'm just going to draw with my selection polygon around my area and click on contour. And now I have a waterline contour here. And if I want to communicate some of my findings with others, movie creation is a good way to do that. So I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. I'm going to clean up my layer tree a little bit, just minimizing some of these. And I'm going to get to my movie section. I'm going to right click movies, click on create new movie. And now as long as this window is open, each time I click the Q key on my keyboard, QT Modeler creates a keyframe. And so I zoom in a little bit, click Q again, zoom in a little bit more, click Q again. And QT Modeler is remembering the camera positioning as well as the data that's turned on. So I've got my surface model, my imagery, uh, including my water level. So now as I zoom in a little bit closer, I'm going to turn on my water. Click Q again so that gets stored. Zoom in a little bit closer to the stadium here and go ahead and raise the water level up a little bit farther and click Q again. I'm going to close my water level. And now I've got a series of bookmarks and QT Modeler can interpolate between them by clicking the play button and it'll zoom me in and follow that path that I've defined. Note that as we get a little bit closer, the water level will turn on and start to drain in. All of the data, the results of the analysis, the settings, the movie, can all be stored in a project that we call Workspace. So I'm going to click on the Export Portable Workspace, and this is a way for me to preserve this data. I can come back to it at a later date, and it's a standalone file that can be shared with others. So they can open up the data, watch the movie, and see the 3D space exactly how you saved it. If you have any questions or feedback about the content of this chapter, or any other topics in the Quick Terrain Modeler, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you.